What can we be done to make the gaming floor a more attractive and inviting place for the serial and casual player? Yeah, Tim. Um, in, interesting question from the point of view that you throw both the serious and casual player in there together. Obviously, they're both very different sort of players and they need to be looked at very differently. You know, a serious player obviously um, yeah, wants a bit more privacy. Um, a, a casual sort of player is probably more main floor style. Um, they're probably all looking for ratings, you know, how you rate them, the experience overall that they're going to get at the casino, and uh, yeah, they, what, how they feel when they walk away from the casino. So you know, you've got to think about them as very different sort of ca um, customers, but again, catered both in the necessary needs that they need. Yeah, I think Tim, maybe just uh, another perspective that we have. You know, when you think about some of the international markets like the U.S. and Australia. Uh, they really create some great theatre and brand experiences on the casino floor by clustering certain brands together. Uh, and it's not just about clustering all a certain game type or all brands together. It's, it's really when you bring a certain mechanic of a game clustered in one zone, there's a lot of action and there's a lot of energy happening. Uh, you know, w when you're in a zone and you're having a, a feature going off every five or ten seconds because there's a certain quantity of, of game type in a certain area, it really can create that energy and, and, and atmosphere to a floor which, you know, we, we, we see, you know, in, in a very strong locals markets across the US and Australia. Uh, and we see little bits of it here, but, you know, I, I think there's a real good opportunity, uh, particularly, you know, as people are starting to come back to the, to the casino floors here in the Philippines. Okay. Andy? Um, firstly, thank you for inviting me onto the panel. My name's Andy, I'm the CEO and founder of Trafture. Um, I think that if the question is how to make the casino floor more attractive, obviously some of the great products that are out there, the, the things that people are touching, but I think we're reaching a, a tipping point in the industry where a number of important components are changing. So for example, um, the previous panel were talking about the expansion of mobile. Of that di those digital touch points. Um, we've also got an expectation of higher service levels and the capability through the data provided from various systems to understand our customers better and so provide a higher service level. However, I mean, in the Philippines is, is, is a really great example of that, but in lots of jurisdictions it's the same. We've also got countersized to that, which are pulling in the opposite direction, uh, AML. is a perfect example of that. Changes the customer experience. One might argue it could be for the better, for the worse, but in purely in terms of the experience, that could be contradicting some of the SOPs, which are supposed to be delighting the patients. So I think one of the, one of the challenges that we have as an industry is as these counter, these competing um, tactical requirements come into place, we need to make sure that they're working together really well so that the customer experience isn't one of being pulled in this direction. Um, it's a hostile experience, it's a positive experience of bouncing between the two. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Takeki, you have some comments on? Yeah, um, thank you very much for visit, uh, inviting me here. I'm a Japanese and then I spent 30 years in Japan working in a, a high-end department store. And then uh, I worked uh, more than three years in Okada Manila here um, as a vice president of a retail. And, and um, retail um, point of view, uh, the customer expect expectation is totally, I can say totally, um, different than before the COVID. Um, first of all, I want to point out one thing. The decision maker is now shifting, not the gamer himself, but their colleagues or the wife or the families. So we have to pay more attention to not the real gamers, but also the, the their friends, families, expectations. So that's my first comment here. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thanks. It's great to have a retail perspective um, today. Um, I mean, we, Andy, you were touching on technology. Um, you know, how does the panel see um, promotional technology driving the industry forward? You talked about data and... Yeah, I, I think we, over the past 10 years, maybe a little bit longer, we, we've seen kind of three-year cycles as defined by gaming shows, whatever the hot topic of the gaming show is. Um, many moons ago, it was Convergence, and then we have Skill Gaming, and then we had um, 
then we've got esports, and then we have online gaming, and it goes round and round and round. And they come and, they, and some stay and some don't. I think that as an industry, we've we've been a little bit behind the curve digitally, in terms of again a holistic experience that where all these different systems talk to each other, and the, all, and the customer it's seamless from a customer perspective. Um, and so, given your, your, your absolutely excellent point about the expectation post C word. Uh, we were forbidden from saying that word by our, by our, by our moderator. Um, post the event um, means that the, the customers are coming in and they're going, right, I want my casino experience on the floor to be as seamless and as easy and as positive as whatever my favorite app might be. Is it banking? Really simple. And, and all, all these touch points in, the, in their lives are becoming more, more simple and easy and embedded and customized and personalized. And I think as an industry, we're reaching an inflection point again where we really need to get our act together on this and, and pull these fragmented data sets and system sets together and ensure that vendors work together nicely, that there aren't um, fiefdoms within casinos which are pulling different directions. Um, and we really have to catch up, I think. And we can, and that's a great thing. We absolutely can. It, it's unfortunate, you're right, the um, gaming industry and technology generally lags other industries as far as technology goes. But we are seeing the next start, um, vision of technology coming along with facial recognition. You know, facial recognition, and whilst it won't identify, you, know, you don't identify the actual player unless he's carded, but you he, he can also start to identify non-carded players and start to give them that seamless experience you're talking about. Obviously, then yeah, you can reward them accordingly to their, their play. You know, you've got more data about them. And of course, now as AI is growing, you know, that using AI to actually da um, retrieve that, or look at that data and give out um, you know, strategies to go forward, that's where the future is going to go, that's where the technology is going to go, and that's where the customer experience is going to get better. Ken, we must be, we must have the same notes because that, that was the same one I was going to go with, but probably just at a little more tactical level, Tim, you know, when we think, you know, players are just really getting back to flaws here, you know, realistically after a good two and a half years out, you know, technology is, is, a, is a lot newer than where it was two to three years ago. So, you know, at, at a more tactical level, when we think about the physical hardware going onto floors, you know, in terms of the cabinets and the machines. You know, there's a lot more virtual technology now that, you know, we're building into the cabinets, which can really elevate that experience from what the player used to be. You know, for example, you know, a lot of the, the cabinets now come with a virtual, a virtual button deck where all the action historically on, on a cabinet has been right in front of them here or at the top box. But, you know, we really now think about our button deck as, as a fourth screen you know, and how we add experience to the game when people get into features by stuff right underneath where their hands are at uh, to give something that they really weren't used to going back three, four years ago. So, you know, that's with the advent of technology. So a little bit more of a tactical example, but something that I think players can start to enjoy and experience as they really come back to the properties. Yeah, thanks, that's a good point. And, and cashless. And cashless. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I agree totally what they are saying because I'm actually a working IT company. Five of a uh, IT company now. I shifted myself to the more IT conscious. And then, but I, I don't want to change the topic here. But but I want to say one thing is that um, more technology advanced. And then during the COVID, we are almost alone watching the YouTube, Netflix, and then that kind of IT environment, and then meeting Zoom. So um, the people expectation to visit IR is asking for more smile, human touch, everything. So what I want to say is, uh, advance of uh, IT technology. On the other hand, I, I hope that every IR operator think much of uh, frontliners way of touching the, the guest. That, that's what I want to add about from your, your messages. Thanks. I think um, uh, in, in markets such as the Philippines, um, where labor is relatively cheap, um, how can humans help create a more interesting environment for visitors to, to IRs? 
Yeah, interesting one, Tim. You know, I've I've pretty well been in Manila all of this year, and you know, I think we know Philippines has got very uh, fantastic service levels when you go into into properties, when you go into a lot of retail and F&B. But there's almost at times an element of over service. You know, I've been into some shops in the last three four months, and you could be swarmed on by 15 people, uh, which you know they're going over and above to create that experience, but. I think it actually, it's one step back and it's really at that training level, uh, you know, around that real education uh, of the staff that are in on the properties. Uh, yes, labor is rather economical here compared to some other parts of the world, but I think it's that investment from a, from a training perspective that can really add the human touch on, on top of what are, are great properties here in Philippines. And you see it in many businesses in the Philippines, like. The other night, for instance, I was in a restaurant. Fabulous service. The minute we sat down, we were given the menu. We had tension the whole way through. Um, at the end, you know, we paid the bill. It was quick. Um, Ever walked out. Every, all the staff said, "Yeah, um, thank you, sir." Walked down the road to the local hotel for a drink afterwards. Sat down for six minutes. No one came near us. Um, had to get up and ask for a drink. So, and then the whole service that evening, like even got didn't they forgot one order? Didn't bring it. Had to go and ask. And then they brought the wrong order. And um, like, it, there's a lot of difference here. And the big thing, and it comes back to what Lloyd just said, training. Got to spend the time on training that staff. Uh, now it's not easy here, but uh, that's what, training's very important. Because yeah, that's an experience where, a good experience and a bad experience in the one night. I think that, like if we go, if we focus on the gaming floor, again, we're talking about a, a, a data-rich environment. Uh, the machines are kicking out more than the meters. We've got F&B integration, we've got loyalty integration, we've got other systemic requirements. Um, that's a hell of a lot for a human being to take on. So I think that something that casinos could do and will do inevitably over the next probably three to five years is that they will empower the staff with technology and let the technology focus on making the decisions that it's best to, to make. For example, um, if we assume that the the gaming player on the floor increasingly wants a personalized experience, even if they're not super VIP, even if they're not even premium mass. The mass, because they're having the experience in the rest of their lives, will want that personalized service. How do you deliver that personalized service when you have a casino with 25 different systems? You've got multiple tiers, you've got promotional elements going on, you've got tens, hundreds of thousands of, 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 of patrons. How does a person do that? Training is hugely important, but it's not enough. And I think we'll get to a point where the technology will say, OK, there's a person over there. This is the information that you need about them. Of all the promotions that are available, here are two that are best suited to achieve whatever operational aim you have. Is it an uplift in play? Is it increasing visitation? Is it higher satisfaction levels? Whatever the action is. And then to say to the person, here's the information you need. We've made a short list and prioritized the person, the promotion, and here's the tools that you need, now go get them. And so you're using that service-oriented culture, you're using that cost-effective labor, but what you're doing, you're turbocharging it, and you're empowering them. And I think we'll see that, that cohabiting of, of technology and the human touch point uh, increasingly, as we are seeing in other, other sectors. And so, certainly the systems in most of the casinos have those uh, modules that can do that stuff, and not everybody activates that. Or, or you know, really put, puts it into power, or they might do initially and then um, not follow it through. But certainly, yeah, there are systems today when a card player or a known player to the casino walks in the front door, it's signaled to a uh, host. A host can go and say hello. They know who they are. They know their preferences. They can um, help them out in any way that they wish. And that's the sort of systems that we've got to have in all the casinos and all the, in gaming in the future. Um. Apart from the uh, IT for the gaming floor, um, I, I want to pick up one example. Um, the casino point, the, they can burn wherever, restaurant, retail, wherever. But um, in Okada, uh, it's, it's so bothering for the, both the guests and then the people working in the front lines. It takes time and then it's complicated. Uh, so there are much rooms to improve for that kind of uh, systems because the, even the big, the guest who has a big point with a Superboy IP have to wait until the, the transaction finished. 
So that's what happening in Okada. So there are much rooms uh, for the IT can play, especially in this country. Uh, even the backyard, the people working in the desks, the paper <laughs> blocked his face. So <laughs> that, that's what actually happening in, in this uh, internet era, IT era, in, in the casino integrated result in Philippines. That's a good point. I mean, in terms of what, what, is, what gaps in the visitor market do you see uh, then for IRs? Um, you know, what could we see around the corner, which is innovative and this is something we haven't seen before? Um, and how does that flow through to, the, to, to gaming? Yeah, uh, big question, Tim. You know, I think it probably first of all starts with what's the target market each of the properties uh, are actually going after. Is it very specific or is it far, rather broad? You know, you know, in my opinion, if I look across the region, you know, Galaxy is probably one of the true anomalies which seem to be able to cover all bases from mass to premium to VIP, from gaming to non-gaming in, in their total offer. Uh, but I think first of all, we'd start with, with who they're going to target. And then when I look across the, the, the market here in Philippines, you know, I, I think there seems to be, not just from a, a, a casino point of view, but just a, a, a country perspective around that convention space. You know, I think uh, as we've all been working through, would there be a G2E Macau or when could there be a G2E? And there's obviously a bit of a G2E in Singapore coming up. You know, there seems to be a gap in the market around true mice and true convention opportunity here in Philippines, which could bring, obviously, a, a lot of business and a lot of an additional opportunity. Um, but then kind of listening to, to Trevor earlier around, you know, Cebu and, and the likes and, you know, potentially targeting that Korean, we know there's a big attraction for the Korean, particularly around golf. You know, there are some great golf courses around the country, but where is some innovation around golf? We're starting to see it around the world, particularly around properties considering things like Top Golf. you know, you know, something quite innovative, but bit of a gap here in the market, I think. So with that connectivity between the Korean being a, a strong gamer, a strong golfer, love comes to Philippines, you know, I think there's a big opportunity around that space. Um, I think, yes, the Philippines have a lot of uh, um, good assets, like golf course, the beach, and which is, uh, we cannot see in Macau or Las Vegas. But um, usually the integrated resort thinks that uh, we won't make the gamers stay longer inside. That, that's the one of the important KPI. But um, after the COVID, we should think the different way. I, I think, you know, I understand the, if a, a VAP stay longer, they spend more. That's true. It's, only one time or one state payment. I just thinking, why don't you think about the frequency of the visit to the IR and the total days of uh, spending, uh, sorry, uh, betting the money in one resort. So if you have a good idea to attract the, their friends, families, girlfriend, wife, so they can, they may go out once but they can come back very often. So frequency is another key of, uh, especially the, the casino, not Macau, not Las Vegas, but the ASEAN casino uh, is important because we here in Philippines have an asset. So that's why I am saying, why don't we make the uh, hotels or the restaurants in the local area to use uh, for the gamers can use the point, the Gino points. Oh, that that then maybe the each outlet or the hotel say, oh, I cannot understand the Chinese or the, how we can burn the point, but IT can do everything. So I I I I'm I'm telling the locality integrated whole area, not not the small um, building area. No no no. Why don't you utilize the asset? you have here in Philippine. That's my new insight after the COVID. Interesting, very interesting. 
so I guess what you're saying is take it even outside the ownership of the um, outlets within the casino. Interesting concept. Um, obviously, uh, as a business, they want to try and keep the keep, keep the money to the yeah. inside. But um, yeah, you're right about the points. Like points earned on the gaming floor should be able to spend in other facilities within the casino, and vice versa. So in other words, if you're shopping in the shopping mall and you're spending money, you should be getting some points to go back and maybe get um, points points to play with things like that. So you can do it both ways. But yeah. I guess an IR is about all the, having all the facilities, you know, whether it be a cinema and, and restaurants, yeah, restaurants, you know, for family to come in, for dinners, whatever, brings the people back to the casino, obviously yeah. you might get some play. So. Um, I think I'd answer your question about you know, what will be that revolution. Um, in the, the title of the panel is Revamping the Asian IR. Yeah. I th so, and, and I, so I think on that, two parts I'd answer that. I think um, if you want to revamp the customer experience, which is what, what really matters, that I'd look in a short term and I'd look at a long term one. The long term one's a bit silly and it's something that I, but I believe in. Um, the short term one is having segments of one. We've, had, we've been discussing segments of one since the 80s. Um, and the industry has never done it and there's no technical reason why they shouldn't. It's just bloody difficult. We do a lot of work in, in artificial intelligence and machine learning, and now technology is getting to the point where you can do it. But I think once we achieve that, and it'll be the system, big system providers like you guys, and it'll be third-party vendors and be the marketing companies, once an IR can hit a segment of one, everything's personalized, everything's unique, and the customer service level automatically goes up. The long term, sort of revolution, which I think will come, will not be defined by the industry. We will be followers in it. And I think that when um, something like um, the metaverse finally becomes a widespread ad adoption, we've got involved in that very early on, purely because it, it, I'm the CEO, so we would decide which direction we're going in. I really, uh, I'm seeing the money going into it, and conceptually, and from a business philosophy point of view, I, I can actually see it happening at some point. When that occurs, and there's a widespread adoption of that from uh, all the major demographics, I think the IRs, the casinos, will be pulled into that direction, and then you'll have this digital hybrid environment, which right now we would struggle to comprehend. It would be very difficult to do, but I think we will get there. And then the whole convergence play that became so big in these conferences uh, a decade ago will really happen. It will go beyond a concierge app. We'll have an immersive experience digitally and land-based, and I'm really excited about that. I think it's going to be really cool. And, and you're right. I mean, metaverse is the, the buzzword at the moment, and um, everyone's trying to understand what that really means. And I know there's people in the room here that even um, are involved in that. But you know, when you look at a gaming floor today, it's still very old-fashioned. You know, rows of machines, benches, um, conventional-looking machines sitting on a you know, big, big box with really nothing inside, monitor on the front. Um, that there's going to be some changes in the industry in the next 10 years, particularly as, as, as a meta, full metaverse gets understood. Um, I think you'll see the gaming floor start to change in some sort of direction that's like way more digital, and the environments they, that they're operating that will be way more digital than they are today. I think, Tim, sorry, just picking up on the, the convergence bit before, we're starting to see around the world, you know, how properties are trying to create that stickiness once a player either goes back to the hotel room or, or departs the property, both at a, at a local and a tourist level. You know, one of the areas, you know, and I think there's various topics coming up over the next few days about online and, and digital, but, you know, around leveraging products like social casino and social gaming solutions such that once they leave the gaming floor in the hotel room or off property, they're, they're playing uh, the property's online app with those games, either for money or, or not for real money, accumulating loyalty points to be used and leveraged once they go back on property. So you're either going to increase that visitation from a local perspective uh, or potentially that annual trip where someone's coming from international, they're, they're coming more often. Can I ask something for the panelists? Could you pick up the good example of uh, usage of uh, Metaverse and uh, integrated results so far? Um, yes, I can absolutely give an example. There aren't yeah, any. Yeah. They don't exist. Ah, so doesn't you know, doesn't yeah, happen. Okay, okay. So that was my long-term yeah, okay, okay. one of that. But I'm, we're involved in it now because it just makes sense to us. Now, will it be here in two years? No, it won't. Ten, maybe. 
I think, I think you've got to think of the young gamer at home at the moment playing games, right? They're sitting in their bedroom looking at a monitor, but they're immersed in that whole experience. Yeah, they're playing with other people online. You know, how do we bring all that to the gaming floor? So I, I know the technology will be rapidly advanced, but um, the integrate, what integrated resort themselves or the people working there have to do is how to utilize what, 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 what we, we can do, what, what, what is the customer needs. No, we are not you know, the technicians or the, the, the development programmers. So we have to market, know, have to know the new market with the new SWOT, the uh, metaverse. That, that's what, what I want to give them the message. It does sound interesting, but, um, and it will also presumably attract a younger demographic, yeah. right? Because you've got this problem about the 55 year old, you know, slot player just dying out. So, what, you know, how, how young can these people be? Um, obviously, they've got money. So, I mean, Andy, could you explain, perhaps I think you probably know more about it than. Russ, could you explain what it would feel like? <laughs> That's more than us. Um, what it would feel like to enter the metaverse for, a, for an integrated resort? Well, for, for those who don't know, the, the, um, the metaverse is just an extension of the internet. It's just the internet. Um, and it's a, it's a virtual reality space, not an augmented reality space. Um, and so you go and you explore a virtual world, which you can interact with people and things, and you can touch them, and you can manipulate them, and you can talk to people and build. It's exactly the same as being on the internet. It's just in a three-dimensional world. Now, in the, in that, it's, and it's very well suited. I remember, I remember seeing someone pitching to me as a casino operator in 2001, um, an early metaverse. They're trying to sell spaces on a casino, yeah. and it was all on 2D, and it was absolutely rubbish. Um, and where we get into now is the technology is, is actually quite cool, and people like Samsung from South Korea are spending a huge amount of money building these digital spaces, um, NFTs. I know there's a few panels about this. Uh, NFTs and blockchain is is is, is becoming quite a um, an elegant way of interacting with it. But from an IR point of view, um, it's quite a simple proposition: is that you would replicate the experience and also make it better and more personalized. So once you're home or you're somewhere else, you can continue to play in an environment that you're, um, you're, you're familiar with. However, the value of that is not to have exactly the same experience. It's to have a community and an interaction which people, let's say, let's say I'm right and in 10 years this becomes a reality. It'll become a reality because the public will have told us that that's what they're doing. And as a casino industry, we are, we are quite good at listening to our customers. We do listen to the patrons, usually. And once, the, the, once that has become mass market and has gone beyond kids, so in 10 years' time, the kids who are just playing with it now, they're going to be knocking on 30. Do you know what I mean? They'll be 25, 30 years old. Um, once that has penetrated beyond that into an older demographic, they'll be knocking on the door because, as I said earlier, their expectation will be of a, a digital experience that now has transcended the two dimensions and moved into that. So I think we will inevitably have to do it, but I think the IRs are perfectly placed to have that seamless customer journey from one to the other. And it, it's, it's genuinely the most exciting thing that I've seen on a very distant horizon with a large pair of binoculars on top of a mountain. I mean, it's a long way away. Yeah. But it will, it will create a seamless transition that we've never achieved before. Could, could you see the emergence of new players to challenge you know, the big guys? Because then they, you know, with, with disruptive technology, whatever it might be, you, know, you tend to get a surprise out of the blue that isn't one of the traditional. You know, and, and only exists in the metaverse, perhaps. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, I, I think we'll see the big guys at some point uh, buying companies that do it or doing their own thing, partnering with people. I, I think that the real value, the excitement comes from it not being a purely digital experience. That lamb touch point, having both together, that's, that's really exciting. It, it'll start with areas or rooms that become um, like a digital experience. So the atmosphere becomes digital to start with. Then over time what will happen is how the player that intermingles or immerses into those digital walls and digital areas, you know, where they, they might be avatars, they might be whatever, you know, a young player comes along and selects an avatar, and all of a sudden they're playing everybody in the room digitally on a wall. 
there's an extra jackpot or something. Yeah. But, but, and also the, the human contact, the host. So as we know from, from casinos around the world, especially potentially the medium-sized ones, um, the hosts very often have a personal relationship with 100, 200 patrons, and they know them. They know them really well. They know their families. They know what's happening at home. Um, being able to have that in the digital space, where your host is greeting you, and it looks like them, I think that'll become a, 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 a norm, and we'll become used to that. Um, okay, I think we've got time for some some questions for the guys. Yes, I can see. Tony from APE. Oh, uh, Mr. Metaverse. Mr. Metaverse, yes. So we actually built a prototype Metaverse called Mini Macau, as you know, you've probably seen. Uh, in hindsight, I think we should have built uh, Mini Manila on Manilaverse. So I'd like to ask the panel, if I was to build Man Manilaverse, what features would you like to see? I know Ken Jolly wants a pig farm for some reason. <laughs> I'm not sure my farm needs to be there. Um, look, this is early days and with Metaverse, and I think we're all trying to get a bit of better understanding. You know, it's, it's like we said before, it's really an extension of the internet and it's creating an atmosphere. How we, how we get from the stale sort of environments we have today into the, starting down that track, there's going to be a little bit of time and thought process. But, you know, hands off to, AG, uh, to you guys that, um, you know, having a crack at Metaverse and, um, and through that we'll all learn more about it. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Tony. Um, any more questions for the group? Sadia? Hi, for, for whoever wants to answer this one. Uh, what I see happening in the casino industry is that as we are moving more and more towards technology, that personal touch seems to be getting lost. And uh, I've always been of the opinion that the more technologically advanced we become, the greater the need for that personal touch. So how do we balance the two? Yeah, I think that, that was that discussion earlier on uh, training and, you know, maybe Ken and I had a fairly rudimentary view on, on, on the educational bit for the staff, but I think that's, that's the baseline for them to be able to then transition into where, where, where Andy was going in and that connectivity around the digital mm -hmm. and being able to just totally provide that data and shuffle people around the property. But particularly from a gaming perspective, uh, I still think there's a huge gap, you know, just around the basic education around the products and services on the floor. Uh, before we can make that shift, uh, you know, to leverage the technology. Yeah, just a small observation, if I may, like, you know, uh, one very rich opportunity is in terms of the players' club, where you involve your members. But in most properties, that's shoved somewhere, you know, by the toilet where nobody goes or, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, it's always relegated to the low priority kind of an arrangement, uh, despite the fact that tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, are spent on loyalty programs. So what can we do to sort of create this awareness about the importance of that personal touch? Because 72% of the people in the casinos, you know, they lose money. It's not that, you know, they expect to win money or they hope to win money but not expect to win money. And I think it's all about that experience, but we are getting away from that personal touch. Uh, I mean, it is moving down that track. For instance, if you have a look at the past, we've been able to track carded players, right? That's somebody that's already become a member. We haven't been able to do non-carded players, but now we can through facial recognition, right? We don't need their names, their data, or any of that information. By taking that information then back and, and putting it in our data warehouses, and, th and unfortunately what happens a lot of the time, that all the data is there and it goes back, but no one bothers to mine it and find out what to do. And unless you're out there really using um, AI type pr processes and mining that data and then understanding what you can do with that, then, then it starts to move. Okay, you're right, you can't go, well, the, the personal touch then, and even now there are systems, not every casino has, but um, for instance, through the databases, when the people enter the casino, they, they're knowing they're actually on property, 
and they know them when they're off property. Yeah, you can send a message or something. So the fact that the, you know they're on property and if you've got those sort of systems, well then you can have those hosts and go and be that personal touch. They've already been armed electronically with the information about that player and the, and the preferences and all the things they want to, you know, the, the, what they want to do, what their favourite drink is, whatever. Use that information, use that data, and then make that personal experience. Make it more personal. The systems are there today to do that. It's just a matter of buying them and adapting them. Yeah, they come from the major gaming companies already. And of course, we're, we're all the time now, you know, I talked a minute ago about uh, carded play versus non-carded play. You know, with, with facial recognition and with the stuff that we're doing now on tables, as far as, you know, recognising chips and, you know, what Walker Digital and other companies are doing in that area, and we're all doing it, and we're all putting cameras in and that sort of te technology to tables, we're going to be able to do full, full accurate measurement of players even on tables. That's where we're going. And I, I think the point you made was, 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 was a valid question for sure. Um, but I'm, I'm more optimistic. Um, I think actually uh, technology isn't going to be something that reduces the nature of, 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 the, of the human relationship and reduces the touch points. I think if anything, it's going to enhance it. The experience that I have with my clients and potential clients is that there is a desire for that human interaction, and actually the absence of technology in the gaming industry has held them back from being able to do it effectively. Um, with that technology, you, you, as I mentioned earlier, you get, a, an, you get an empowered employee. They can target the person in real time, in the right place, deliver the right message, build an effective relationship, critically capture the metadata that normally the staff keeps in here, and when they leave to go to another company, they take to the other casino across the road, um, I mean, we, we sort of see that Macau every day. Um, I, 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 I'm really optimistic about it. And I think by embracing technology, which all of us are, we're, we're all building, um, I think we will see a, a higher level. I may be wrong, but I, I want to stay optimistic about it. Okay, I think that is, um, oh, Peter, sorry, mate. One more question. Uh, so technology to me is not about empowering the the operation is, but how do you empower the customer and making their experience better? So if I walk in a casino and the, if I use the metaverse, um, I want the technology to improve my play rates, to improve what I see as, as a customer. So, you know, if I'm wearing, if you like Google glasses, for instance, I want information to come out at me, it tells me, you know, winning trends maybe on slot machines, uh, a lot of information that improves the way I play. If I'm more empowered, I'm probably gonna play more and my experience is gonna be feel better because I feel more educated and I feel I know more about the game. Just as in poker, if I could understand and, and work out the, the percentages in my head of how much chance I have of getting that pot, I would play better. And, and obviously good poker players do that. How do you see the industry coming together on a global level? Are you all doing individual self sort of uh, uh, development in this area, but it's got to be a more global thing, like the, you know, your manufacturers have got to be a global level, how, what technology is going to work across all the systems and bring the information that I'm not just looking at uh, Light and Wonder games, I'm not just looking at Aristocrat games, I'm not just looking at tables, I want it to be a global experience for me and improve my level on all uh, areas. So how do you see that from a different manufacturer basis? Gee, getting us all to work together, wow. <laughs> We've got businesses to run, shareholders to please. Um, <laughs> look, there are industry associations, there are um, conferences like this, you know, our senior technologists all go to those sort of things. There's a lot of talk amongst the industry, guys are moving around, but like, there will always be different technologies down different tracks, and unfortunately, trying to get everybody on the same track is not probably that practical. I think perhaps a, a way to, a, to approach is actually what I see every day, which is the casino operators are demanding this. And what they're doing is, they're taking the two approaches I see. One is they buy everything from one company. Totally valid, if they get what they want for the right price, all good. Um, the other approach they take is they say, okay, I will have my CMS from here, my loyalty from there, my AML from there, whatever. And then I'm going to engage a, a third party to be that integrative layer that ties it all together. The, the end result is the same. And I am seeing that movement, and it, and it is starting to go in that direction. Um, uh, this is not the uh, direct answer to your question, but I am uh, in an industry of retail, 
what is happening in each detail is um, the metaverse setting cannot be yet the live commerce. So they are fighting each other, and then maybe they can, they can cooperate, but the metaverse is much stronger than the metaverse e-commerce so far. So this is one of the, what is happening now. I, get, I cannot guess in 10 years, but that, that's true now. So we have to think we, we people uh, related into the integrated result, how we can utilize that kind of technology. We are the person to think about it. Interesting. And one last question, Harman. Thanks, Tim. Um, nice panel, guys, and a number of interesting points that were made. I think um, the point that Peter John made, PJ made, just now, uh, related to working more together, I think that's an absolute um, starting point. Um, I think we have a problem because the smaller companies that actually bring a lot more uh, innovation haven't been able to really break through. It's too complex, too expensive, and too cumbersome, talking to all the regulators all across the world, etc. Um, but the point I wanted to make is that I think um, the human experience, or let's say the, you know, the personal touch, is very important with regards to the players that we have today. But what about the players that we really want to get? Because we're talking about you know, a an, an 15, 20, 25% segment of the total market, etc. I actually believe that the younger generation wants a personal touch, but in a very different manner. They don't want to be in somebody's face, but actually, and they don't want to be treated like they're somebody special, but they do want to feel that you know that they're there and that they're very special. I also believe that the IRs are still being built as behemoths that basically are going to look pretty similar 10 years from now. Why not create a far more, you know, we all know the pop-ups, we all know, you know, what is happening in retail where, you know, everything changes so fast. The, you know, the G generation and the, you know, Z generation, et cetera, they have much higher expectations on, you know, change and on differences and on, you know, not everything, you know, if they come, you know, a week from now, a month from now, you know, uh, three months from now, they want to see things differently. You know, Zara is not for nothing successful because of the fact that they just churn around, you know, their fashion, not three times a year or four times a year, depending on the seasons, but, you know, 10 times a year, 20 times a year. And I think the IRs are still not doing a good enough job. I think casinos in general are not doing good enough of a job. We as an industry are not talking enough, and I would like to see the um, IRs and the leaders to take a much stronger position in basically saying, why is the industry not following certain you know, criteria in order to help us all, in order to build that level of innovation much, much faster? Um, I'd like to see how the individual companies, you know, will play into that because I think you guys are the leaders of the industry. So thanks to see more of it. Do you want to make a comment? Yeah, just from a, a supply perspective, I guess we're, we're ingredient brands, you know, to the property. You know, we provide the, the products and services and solutions. Just purely from a, a you know, a gaming manufacturer's perspective, you know, it's about just putting a few eggs in that innovation bucket because a lot of the operators uh, are fairly fixated on you know certain re return on investments today versus into the future. So you, you're bang on around creating the products and solutions to trends to bring in that new player. But it is really about working with the properties around you know certain ROI requirements today versus how much space do they allocate to that new experience to bring in that new breed. OK, I think uh, that wraps it up for, for this panel. Thanks for your time. And thank me uh, with, the, with the panelists, please. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you.